Hi, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Mary Giuliano and my guest today is Don Barnett. Now some of you will probably recognize his name and probably his face too because I met Don because of him being involved with the Community Channel and I can't remember how many years ago that was. Yeah, well, yeah, it was called Shaw Cable in those days. No, not Shaw, Monarch. Monarch, Monarch yeah, Cable. Monarch yeah. Cable. Yeah. It was near the end of the Monarch Cable era. Yeah. Shaw came in and things all turned over. But up until that point, as a hobby, when I came to Fernie, I got into uh, interviewing people and uh, old timers around the town. And they told me some of their stories. But when I came to Fernie... Mm -hmm. That's what I'd like to hear. I came from Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. And I came here... And my wife said, well, we looked at different places to retire. And uh, she said, well, let's settle in Fernie because it seems to be a town with a story. Hmm. So, so that kind of drew us to Fernie. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's a nice place. It's in a nice setting. And uh, it was at the time when the ski hill, when Heiko first, he, he just was selling the ski hill. Hmm. And we looked at lots down in the annex and elsewhere. And uh, I went uh, to another town to look there, forget which town. Came back, and in, in the meantime, it was announced Heiko had sold the ski hill. And prices jumped by three and four fold. And lots that we were looking at for two or three thousand dollars were now eight and nine and ten and twelve thousand dollars. And that happened within a few days, almost you would say overnight. So I was totally disgusted. I left Fernie and said, well, so much for that town. But before I left the real estate person, I said to her, well, you know the kind of house we're interested in. You give me a call in Saskatchewan if something comes up. And away we went. And about a month later, the phone rang. She told me about the place. And I bought my house in Fernie, sight unseen, over the telephone. And, and uh, faxing was becoming more common then. And I bought it through uh, the, the telephone and the fax machine. and. Uh, and what unseen. year would that have been? About the year uh, 2000, in there somewhere. And where did you buy in Fernie? West Fernie. In West Fernie? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, going up Burma Road. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy by the name of Larry Sedrovic was the neighbor across the street, a long time. I, I went to school Fernie. with Larry. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, we, uh, that's, that's how we, got, uh, we came to Fernie. And uh, Shaw Cable wasn't in, in town. No. Monarch Cable was. Yeah. Ken Odeland yeah. was the That's manager. That's the guy, yeah. And he wanted to do some local stuff. And uh, so I was the guy in, the ca in front of the camera doing the interviewing like you're doing now. And a guy by the name of Helmut Emmert mm -hmm. ran the camera. And then John O'Brien ran the camera a time or two. Oh, John too? Uh, a little bit, a, a, a few times. But mainly it was Helmut. So, Don, what did you do in, in Saskatchewan? Well, mainly I was a prof at the University of Saskatchewan, and, uh, but I also built up a, a, a greenhouse operation, a commercial one, and I thought I could just move from the job right into doing greenhouses, but we built it up so much that the labor killed us in those greenhouses. We grew hydroponic tomatoes. Oh, did you? So we decided we, we have to get out of town. Yeah, you have to specialize, yeah. You, you can't have several different plants. Uh, growing in the same greenhouse, if you've got a thousand or two in there, you know, you have to streamline. And so if you kill one bug for that plant, you don't have to worry about some bugs on another mm -hmm. kind of plant. Yeah, but uh, we, we came here and uh, uh, I can tell you a few stories of the people told me. <laughs> let's, hey, I'd like to hear those. Let's, let's, but I want to yeah. ask about the house. The one that I came in to see you when I did a story on your wife's beautiful uh, teddy bears that yeah, she used right, to make. Yeah. Did you not build that house? That was an old house built in early 1900s. And I've, I've been a house builder. I've built numerous houses. And we ripped that thing apart, half apart, and built up and over it. And people who had come to visit us uh, when we first came here, they saw the old original house, kind of a coal miner mm -hmm. kind of level house, uh, old house. Uh, some people, some of those people came back a year or two or three later and they couldn't find our place. They drove by the street, they didn't recognize it because I completely built over it and up high, built a, 
a big two-story modern type of house so over the top of that. Yeah, it was a big house. And, and the taxes then were based on the original age of the original house. Well, you would know this. You're the mayor, and, and half the taxes, I think, were, were, was based on that. Well, early you, 1900s. Would, you would have been paying taxes to the regional district, right, which right. is like yeah. a third of what the city of Fernie pays right. anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love all the houses that I built, and I built about 10 or 15 of them after I retired from Saskatchewan. Uh, I recognize the greatest net profit from this Fernie house because I bought it so cheap. You know, depends on what you pay in, initially. Mm -hmm. That'll determine your profit and that's a prime example of that. I bought the house for very little and then it's built up and of course all of the outside people from Alberta came to the new ski hill. Mm -hmm. Prices as you know went up and yeah. I sold and uh, recognized a, a handsome profit. <laughs> and is that the reason you left Fernie? Because we missed you. Well, I don't know. I can't remember why I left Fernie. I went to Kimberley and now I live in Cranbrook, so I've moved around. And, but I've always moved around and built houses. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, Now I've got a, a houseboat in the Kukanusa and I've got a, a plaque there. It says, home is where the anchor drops. And, and you know, th that, that can be true to a great extent. Where were you born? In Alberta. In Central Alberta. Alberta, town called Stedler, oil town. Yeah. Okay. So and I grew up the first 30 years in Alberta and the, the next 30 years in Saskatchewan. So you were a professor though, right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so a professor yeah. that can build houses, that can grow Green tomatoes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Right. Yeah. You have we a lot of, yeah. who's a filmmaker. And, and, and I have a farm background. We had cattle and hogs and chickens and every kind of other animal. I mean, we butchered our own meat. and. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you're quite the nothing. Quite the guy. Nice. Nice to diversify sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you came to Fernie and you decided you would get into, or had you been doing filming before? No. 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 Not really. No. Not not too much. No. I got into it mainly because of this guy Helmut, and I guess that's before we talked to you. It yeah. seems like you've always been the mayor of Fernie, but uh, no, no, because when we started, when worked, I was yeah. on, I was like on council. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so uh, yeah. So Helmut got you in interested because he, I don't know, he was a media kind of a oh, person. Oh, okay, because you know. he was a banker. Right, that's right. Yeah. But 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 in his retirement, I think he fooled around with cameras and media, mm -hmm. and so on quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah. what was the first thing you, the first person you interviewed? Well, I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember. I thought we did close to two hundred uh, shows. Oh, I'm sure you did a whole and, lot. And I can't remember uh, some of the ones. I, uh, I remember uh, a guy, uh, I can't remember really. Uh, I remember uh, one guy, uh, Bill, it was Bill Milburn. I don't want to yes, use names here. Bill anyway, yeah. No, no, it's great because Bill yeah. Milburn was, uh, and his wife who was uh, Doreen Hockley, those were families that were in Fernie for years. Yeah, well, Bill, uh, you know, Coal mining was a dangerous thing in, in, in this tunnel mining, you know, collapse and the, the poisonous gas and so on. And Bill worked all of his life in the coal mine. And I said, Bill, uh, were you hesitant about going to work there? And he says when he was a young guy, like other young guys, they couldn't wait to get into those coal mines to go to work. Really? They just, and Bill said in, in his own case, he told a lie to get in. You had to be a certain age, maybe you had to be 16 years old. And Bill told him that. He was 16, they believed him, but he was really only about 14 because he was kind of a, he was a big guy. And mm -hmm. he yeah, he was a tall man. Yeah, he looked 16, so mm -hmm. he just couldn't wait to get in there. And, and Bill became the, the head of the, uh, he, he looked after uh, the horses, and there's a lot of horses oh, in yeah, the coal yeah. mines there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, he, yeah, there's, there's lots of uh, horse stories uh, uh, there. The one, one story I remember, now this wasn't with Bill, it was with another person. But they had a, uh, a, a collapse, uh, uh, an avalanche in the mine, and uh, this horse was caught in the tunnel, and they couldn't get it out. But the men could crawl out in a little hole. And so that's what they did, and they got into furry, and they were here a couple of days, and the one guy said to the other, uh, uh, you know, that horse is going to probably be dead in there. We should go up and see the horse. So they crawled back through the hole in the mine tunnel, and... Uh, the horse was there, so they gave the horse water and grass, 
And they did that for several days. And while they did that, they kept digging at the hole and making it bigger. To, they thought they could get this horse out. And after uh, four or five or a week or something like that, they finally got the hole big enough and the horse came out. And, and, and one of the uh, things that the guy said, that horse recognized that it had been saved by those two guys. Wow. And he says that horse just put its nose into their shoulders and neck and, and just and put his head up and down. He couldn't get close enough to those men. Oh. In a sense, the horse was mm -hmm. thanking them. Yeah. He, you know, he appreciated the getting out of the, the mine. Uh, yeah, so uh, animals are kind of like humans, only a little smarter. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, what else can I tell you about? I, I interviewed a, a person uh, who uh, grew up in Cold Creek, and uh, even though there was a lot of coal dust, white seemed to be the thing. Maybe you know about this. Uh, people wore white blouses and, and white shirts and that, and and uh, the, the woman said she spent a lot of her time washing. I bet. And, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, another story I heard was, uh, you know, I guess the railway came down into town here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the miners and the people would come down on a Saturday, and they would come and get their groceries, and the men would drink in the bar, talking with each other and so on. And, and the train, the, la the, the, the train that left in the late afternoon, let's say 5 or 6 o'clock, it, uh, it sounded a warning, an announcement, with three toots of the whistle at different times. Yeah. Each, each toot of the whistle was about, uh, let's say, five minutes or ten minutes apart. Mm. And the men knew to the second, and because the train was very consistent all its time, first whistle, everybody in the bar ordered more booze. Second whistle, they're drinking like crazy. Some had already kind of left on the second whistle. But if you waited for that third whistle, you better run from the hotel to the, the uh, train station, which is up where the swimming pool yeah. is at uh, today. Oh, uh, right close, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, he says, he, uh, Bill Milburn said he, he ran numerous times along with other guys. The train was starting to pull out, and they jumped in the side of the train and caught it at the last minute. Where the aquatic center is now yeah. Yeah. was what they called the... Um, Michelle, Fernie, um, Morrissey, it was the MFMM shops and that's where the trains always ended. But I also read that First Avenue that has all the bars, has the Fernie, the Royal and um, it had the Elks at one time, um, that was the main street because oh, yeah. The people would get off the train, yeah, and well, they'd if, go there. If, if if that was the main street back in the early days, that's where guys would have jumped off the Morrissey Ridge in those hand gliders when they first had them, mm -hmm. and they would sail down, and they, the the route was to then come down and land on Main Street, and they would come down and mm -hmm. do a run, and, but that was right on the Main Street, which wouldn't be the Main Street today, you're saying. It's right, a, it's First place. Avenue was the main, yeah. the one banking the, oh, yeah. the, yeah. the railroad. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. okay. there's a lot of businesses uh, along that uh, road. Okay. But then yeah. after, I think it was after it burned down the second time, they, the, they uh, situated mm -hmm. the Main Street on Second Avenue, right. which was Victoria yeah. Avenue. Yeah. Well, on, on, on the uh, TV shows, we uh, did a lot of, uh, uh, we're down to one minute here, so we may as well quit, is that right? We don't yeah. want to... Hi, we're back. So, Don, yeah. I just, you, you said something about when you chose Fernie that your wife said, do you want to repeat that, about Fernie having a My story? My wife said, Let, let's go to Fernie because it's a town with a story. So... Yeah. When you came here, and you'd been here for a while, did you find that to be true? Right, well, especially when I got talking to uh, older people on this TV program. But it was good right from the beginning. I mean, I, I, uh, we, we saw a black bear right along the edge of town, and I s just thought, you know, coming from the prairies, hadn't seen a lot of black bears in the wild, and I just thought, well, if this is a good place to live if there's bears like that nearby. Now, in the meantime, they've been killing several dozen every year, but, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know. What was the name of your program on Monarch? On TV here? Yeah. I don't know, 
but when the guy left and went to Saskatchewan and started up a radio station, I continued to give him radio shows. I and did I, too. Did you? Yeah. And 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 Stuart uh, and I, Stuart Deacon and I. Oh yeah. And, well, well, I would end those shows. I remember. I would tell a story about something, and then I would say, "And you can stick that in your pipe and smoke it," and that was my wrap up to those shows. But I didn't have those with the shows in Fernie. I don't know. I don't even know the name of the show. I'm sure there was though a title to it because they, I can remember watching it. Yeah. But you believe that you did about 200 shows, if not more. Yeah, well, well what got us going, we wanted to do uh, a story or tell the story about the historic buildings. Mm -hmm. And most of them were on Main Street, but not all of them. Right. Uh, the, like the, there were families that kind of dominated the area. Mm -hmm. I can't think of their names, but there was a family before the last family uh, who ran the hardware store. Oh, the quails. Uh, quails, mm -hmm. but more recent than quails. Uh, the woman ran the, the store. Oh, uh, the IGS yeah. people, the Sombrowskis. Sombrowskis, yeah. Uh, kind of families that were influential in the community. And before them there was a family called Stewart's. Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell with you? Oh, yeah. And, and they had a big home. And, and often these families that kind of became the leaders in the community, uh, they, they, they were upper management people with the mines. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in the further back you went, the more those families kind of dominated the local area as if, as if it were their kingdom type mm -hmm. of thing. And if we're going to start, really, um, Mr. Trites and Mr. Wood were right, the ones right, that right. Uh, yeah. actually owned the mine and right. built yeah. most of yeah. the yeah. the town here in Yeah, the, the uh, town was dominant. Yeah. But, 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 but the community itself, uh, I'm thinking more of Coal Creek mm -hmm. upstream. Uh, rather than Fernie itself. But Coal Creek, not unlike other early mining towns, they were very racist in nature. Like there was Germantown and French Town, and uh, you know, they were all in the, 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 the various European ethnic mm -hmm. groups. And uh, I can tell you a story of, about a woman mm -hmm. uh, who had some trouble over that, that ethnic thing, or, or her husband did, because uh, she came to Fernie with her husband and, and got a job in the mine. But these people were Polish people, and and she left uh, her her country in Poland, uh, her her community in Poland, when she was a young teenage girl, and the Russians and the Germans were fighting Second World War then, and the river ran through the middle of their town, and the Russians were on one side, the Germans the other, and they decided to split the country. But you didn't dare go across, and of course people had families on the other side of the river, so in the winter time. Uh, this girl decided we, she wanted to go over and see her aunt on the other side of the river. And she, and so she went at night and walked across the ice. Coming back home, uh, the Russians caught her and uh, put her into a cattle car and shipped her off to Siberia. And uh, she never saw her mother. I don't know if she ever saw her mother again or maybe she saw, uh, you know, 20 years or 30 years later. But uh, th this woman, who eventually ended up in Fernie, spent the rest of the winter, or the, the, not the winter, uh, uh, the war, in Siberia. And uh, when the war was over, what do the Russians do with all of these people in these concentration camps in Siberia? Well, they weren't going to spend money looking after them. The, the, the war had been devastated, uh, you know, the country had been devastated. So they kind of opened up the, the gates and said, uh, Goodbye, start walking. Same thing when they put the, uh, in the First World War, when they put people uh, here in Fernie, first in the skating rink, people of Eastern mm -hmm. European descent, right? Put barbed wire around the skating rink, filled it up so much, so many people, they decided to then move them out of town to Morrissey. Right. And when the war was over, what did they do there? Same thing as, as this woman's experience in Siberia. What do we do with these people now? Gee, we're not fighting anymore. Would just open up the gates, and in the case of, of the, the Fernie people here, those guys who had been rounded up in the mines, the Eastern Europeans, and put in the uh, concentration camp uh, in in Morrissey, they walked back from Morrissey back into Fernie. This is a story I was told, and uh, they and the mine said, "Oh, hey, there's jobs here. We need workers." They went back to the same jobs. So getting back to this woman. Uh, they opened up the gates there in Siberia. She started walking. 
and she walked. She got a few short cart rides in two-wheel carts pulled by with oxen and horses. But by and large, she walked from Siberia to the Middle East. And she came to either Baghdad or Tehran. Tehran's in Iran. Baghdad is, don't even know the country it's in. Doesn't matter. But Baghdad, uh, I think she was there. She went into the hospital looking for a job. And they said, yes, you can uh, uh, work. And uh, in the hospital, she had some nursing in her background. And uh, so anyway... From there, she went to England. She was a small woman, and she got to fueling the airplanes that were doing the final bombings in the war. And because her hands were small, she could reach into the small areas in the cockpit and so on of the planes and, and undo screws and then put wires in. And she did that job for a while. War was over. She and her husband that she had met in England, he was a Polish guy, came to Fernie. And he got a job working in the mine at Cold Creek. And now here's a Polish guy, the foreman. A lot of uh, German people after the war also came here, mm -hmm. worked in the mines. Now these German guys are taking orders from this Polish guy. A and they had trouble handling that. Okay. They were not going to take orders from any Pole. And so she, uh, this woman said that she had a lot of uh, trouble. Uh, another part of her story was... When I interviewed her, she said that she had been a, a, a singer, an entertainer before the war. And she was uh, in the shower all of the time in, in the Middle East, in Baghdad. And some of the Allied troops, uh, the, the leaders there, said, Gee, you have a beautiful voice. Why don't you sing for the troops? So the latter part of the war, before she went to England, she entertained the uh, troops. So I said to her on this t uh, interview, I said, Well, can you still, still sing? She was in her 80s, late 80s then. And she says, I can sing. So she sang me a song on, on the TV show, one in, first in Polish, and then she sang it in English. And the song was, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, My oh. Bonnie Lies Over the Sea. And, and you could tell with her voice, even though she was in her mid-80s, she, she had a voice. You know? That was an English song, yeah. isn't it? Well, I don't know, is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, so anyway, the, that was the background of that woman whose husband worked in the, in the coal mine. And the thing about the coal mine uh, drew a lot of people from different walks of life. And, uh, yeah, it sure was, did. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, okay, so what else can I tell you about coal mine stories? That's about it. How about some stories about the snow and the blizzards? Yeah, that's part of Fernie. I, I tell you, we don't get snow like before. But I understand, that, and maybe you can remember this, but here's a story I've heard, that in the winter time, some winters, it was almost a town of tunnels. The snow was piled so deep that you went from along the uh, tunnels that had, you know, snow piled up. On I can each tell side. you that I was raised on First Avenue uh, mostly because the sawmill was across the tracks, and okay. so my father didn't have a vehicle and he had a job there, so he purchased a house on First Avenue. And I remember it being almost like tunnels. Uh, mm -hmm. going from the back of the house to the alleyway because coal and wood stoves you had to take the ashes yeah. out every day. Yeah. And even along the roads when you were out, when we were walking to school, it, I mean, you, of course we were little, so, but it, I'm sure it had to be, the piles had to be up to 15 feet high. There was so much snow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, a, a guy told me that he, uh, in a big blizzard, he went to the curling rink, he was curling, and parked his car or truck in, in the parking lot and went in and curled, maybe started at four in the afternoon. They had supper there and they drank and this guy was, uh, he, he, he knew how to drink and, and socialize. And they never got out of the curling rink until about midnight. And they came out and they couldn't find their cars in the parking lot. It's unbelievable, the snow so that came snow. down. And all they saw was bumps and that. And, and there's no way you could shovel your way out uh, uh, any kind of a path to get your car out. He said some people's cars stayed in that parking lot until the spring. Now, he got his vehicle out because he was near the edge or something. But he said some of them stayed in the spring over one big snowfall. Well, certainly in the 50s and 60s, there was more snow than there is now. 
on the streets. I think yeah. on the mountains yeah. we're still getting enough. When I was in West Fernie, and I had my house there, a neighbor there, an older fellow who had worked in the mines, uh, I made a comment in the spring. I said, you know, it looks like this, the snow is uh, melting and, and people were always talking about water in their basement and so on. He says, yeah, he says, no, no, we're uh, past the peak now. The, the water came right up to the bottom of, of in my basement, right up to the floor joists, uh, the, 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 the ceiling joists. But he said, this dropped down a little bit now, so we're, 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 we're through the worst part of it. And, and uh, he was a guy who, who tried to keep the water out of his house. But it flooded, like I say, right up the, the let's say, eight feet, uh, the whole basement. He says, I finally gave up trying to keep the water out. So he opened up the window on this side, the water filled into the basement, and he opened up the window on the other side, the basement window, and the water flowed out. Hmm. Now, th that's how much water uh, came in at, at that time. And, uh, and, uh, and I was in his house, and uh, one thing I wondered, what about his furnace and that? But no, no, he had moved his furnace and all of his mm -hmm. belongings up on the main floor. But uh, we just don't realize the amount of snow that uh, oh, yeah. that Fernie used to get at one time. I can actually recall in the spring walking to school on 2nd Avenue where there would be this much water from the melted snow on the road. Yeah. So you couldn't walk in the water, so we would walk in the big piles of snow on the side. By the time you got to school, you were all wet. Yeah. And I think from March to April, I had a cold and sneezed the entire two months because yeah. you were always cold and yeah. wet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For any is yeah. definitely changed. Yeah. Well, you know, while we're still talking here, uh, I want to tell you a couple of bear stories. And Fernie is full of bears, grizzly bears yeah. and black bears. Okay. Because we got two minutes to... Okay, let's, let, let's quit. With two minutes to go. Is that going? What are we going to talk about next? Well, you're going to ask me about changes in furniture. Yeah, oh yes, I was. I was going to ask you what you've noticed from when you first came to now. What what changes do, have you noticed? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I say not a, lot, not a lot of changes. It was already, the trend had, I was on the initial part of the trend of, of new people coming in. And, and the, the big money from Alberta with the oil boom there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I know that uh, Fernie people, the long-term people seem to be kind of swamped, whether they liked it or not, by this new money and new people. And I always say, uh, if, if, if you're in Fernie, the local people ask you two questions. One, uh, where were you born and how long have you been here? And you better have long-term Fernie answers, or you were never, in their eyes, seen as really a Ferniite. Uh, but but as the years went by, it it just so much money and new houses, and uh, everybody got swamped. And uh, it's not that people complained about being swamped. Mm. I was one of the ones who, now that I lived in Fernie, I complained about all of the Albertans coming with their money. But I liked their money. But I didn't like them to stay around. <laughs> you know, they would come and visit and then leave their money and then go. Mm -hmm. I, I became more of a Ferniite. Uh, but uh, I, I was never one of the true original Ferniites. But, 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 so that's been the change. That, that kind of attitude and, and perception about the community, it's just been diluted and diluted and diluted, and that's the nature of change. Mm -hmm. Communities change and, and, you, and you can't uh, uh, avoid that. Uh, no, I, uh, but I, I don't know. I, I, you, you see the new buildings. Uh, Lots of new buildings. You uh, see the visible stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I've been away from Fernie, so I don't know how the, the, the people I know who have been long-term people here, we've, we've kept a few contacts. Uh, I would say those people themselves have not changed that much. I mean, you don't change your personality That's just true. because new buildings and new vehicles mm -hmm. and new houses yeah. come in. You uh, you uh, keep your same base. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that uh, Fernie has just uh, it's has been, Fernie's been able to cope with the changes very well because there was money coming in. 
compared to a community, let's say that, uh, I think for a while in contrast, when I left Fernie and went to Kimberley, uh, I think Kimberley struggled more it did. In, in, in the downturn mm -hmm. times or in the change times because they didn't have any alternative. They just had a little ski hill there. But, but uh, so it was maybe, a, who knows if it was harder or that, but uh, no, I, I, uh, I, I come back to Fernie all the time. We, we, you know, uh, I come back probably every other month to Fernie. Mm -hmm. So I, I've, uh, I haven't seen great changes because I've kept contact with the place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you did 200 shows at least. Out of those 200 shows, which you did of Fernie and area, mm -hmm. um, there must have been an impact to you from, from having interviewed so many people. Was there one besides Bill Milburn and his uh, talks that he did about Cold Creek, were there any that you remember that you want to mention? The, the other people? Yeah. Well, I, I can't remember the, the names of people, uh, but, but Grace Welly, wasn't that a... Oh, Grace Dvorak. Dvorak? Yes. Yeah. She was uh, I, uh, I remember considered Fernie's poet. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, I did an interview with a guy who lived at Hosmer, and at one time he was the, uh, for the city of Fernie, he was their chief engineer. Oh, or, uh, Fred Lightfoot. That's the guy. Yeah. He told me the story about, you know, where the, along the highway where the farmer's market is held in the, in the playground for the kids. That was a nice outdoor swimming pool at one time. And uh, it, it was kind of state of the art at the time in the area. And, it uh, was. Uh, and I, and, but, but when it closed up, uh, if I've got my decades right, he told me that uh, there was an economic downturn. And, and a lot of uh, people were laid off in the mines I mean, at the time. And there was talk about doing something with the old swimming pool and making the park that's there today. So there was a lot of uh, people unemployed, a lot of men. Mm -hmm. So uh, this guy Lightfoot said, okay, let's do this project. We've got some time now. We'll tear down the old swimming pool and, uh, and, and, and make the new area, but we're going to have a rule. There's no machines to do it. No, no, uh, no machinery. O only shovels. So the the workers that he had were uh, thought he was crazy, and they resented it and they kind of scoffed at. And this is about the dumbest thing that we're trying to do a major project here, and all of this the tractors are sitting out there and the hydraulic equipment and and we're doing it like we're in 1900. Just the dumbest thing in the world. But he said that that project took a summer or two or three to kind of get completed over time. And by the time the guys finished, they were near tears that it was over because they enjoyed it so much. It gave them employment, and that was his idea. If we have the machinery, we'll be done this thing in six months and uh, nothing to do. So let's spread it over time. So that was a story that he told me hmm. on, on the building of that uh, uh, park there along mm -hmm. the highway. Which is kind of an interesting story, where, it is. where a guy uh, I hadn't heard that one before gets gets people to go away from technology, uh, you know, just because the the time is available. Mm -hmm. He said, like he said, everybody was unemployed. Yeah, and uh, okay, where are we going from here? We well, were going to talk about bears. Well, I only know a couple of bear stories, and and Fernie, is, is, I'm sure, has a thousand bear stories, but a couple sort of stayed with me. Okay. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll tell you the shorter one first. I know a guy, this is bicycle country, and the, the avid mountain bikers come and they go the trail. And this guy went biking, but he was aware of the bears. He lives in, in Fernie. So he bought uh, bear wear, uh, the bear, uh, bear, bear spray. spray. Mm -hmm. He was equipped, one on each side of his belt. And he, he, he kind of looked forward, he says, meeting a bear, just oh, to yeah. test his stuff out in real life. <laughs> so he goes for a bike ride, and away he's biking, and he's looking down at the front wheel, and he hears a noise, and he looks up, and here's a bear, the grizzly bear, full speed. And they can run about the speed of a racehorse for a short distance. 
in no time that bear was out. He just froze and panicked and fell to the ground, scraped himself up, bruised himself up, and uh, he's laying under his bike, and this bear comes right over the top of him, and he's frothing at the, at the mouth and slobbering, and he says the smell of the bear was, was just terrible. And, and the bear was kind of spitting out. He thought he, he was dead. He, he said he felt kind of a paralysis just at his head when he it's first saw funny, the bear. But, it, but it's, it's, it's funny now. Yeah. But it it, he says he just felt paralysis over him as he lay under his bike and the bear over the top of him. He thought he was absolutely dead, no chance. And the bear turned around, as grizzlies will do on a false charge. They're known to false charge at times, right? The bear turns around, runs away. And the guy just, he says, I never even thought of my bear spray. I mean, there was no type of, he says, I never even thought of it. And he says, I still didn't think of it. He dusted himself off, got on his bike. And he says, the funny thing is, the exact same thing repeated. Same thing. The bear charged, it surprised him. Even though he knew what, the bear came over, he thought he was dead, he fell off the bike again. The bear growled and snarled over him and spit on him, turned around and ran away. And so that's one bear story. And he says he never, he says that bear spray isn't quite what it's all cracked up to be. Well, if it need, is effective you sometimes... Need to you, have, you need to take uh, directions on how to use that bear spray. Well, <laughs> yeah. Because it's not just uh, as simple as pulling no, it out. It's, it's like a fire extinguisher. Everybody's got fire extinguishers, yeah. but they don't know how to work. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's, that's one story, that, uh, but, but um, here's another story, and you may know it, and there's different versions of it, but I talked to the guy who was part of it, who was the main part. Anyway, these three guys, a man and his 14-year-old son and a neighbor, are out hunting, and they're walking across a very steep rock scree slope, following a little path, and... Uh, uh, the guy's, uh, where I got onto this story, the guy had his shirt off in the summertime around West Fernie there somewhere. And I was talking with him, got, and I said, geez, what are those little brown marks on your shoulder, kind of a semicircle, about the size of a dime? And they were like big freckles. And he says, well, that's where a big grizzly bear grabbed me. And his teeth went right in the, there, and that's where his teeth went in that left that, uh, those, those marks. So he then told me the story. So he's, uh, he's hunting with his neighbor and the neighbor's son. They're walking across the slope, like I was saying. And they're all carrying their rifles, but their head is kind of down, watching their footing. And the first guy, who's the father of the boy, uh, the boy, let me just get this story straight. I think the boy was at the back. This guy was in the middle, and his neighbor at the lead. The, the neighbor, the leader, hears a noise, looks up, here's a big grizzly bear coming at him full speed, just like the guy in the bike I was telling you about. That guy had only time to throw himself down the steep slope, and he rolled and rolled into the grass, into some bushes, into the feet of three other grizzly bears. Oh, golly. The, the <laughs> I truth, didn't expect that. <laughs> the, the truth is stranger than, than fiction. He's at the feet of these grizzly bears. These bears are surprised, as he is. You know, he's bruised up a bit, and the bears sort of back up, and they scamper, and away they go. The big grizzly, on the trail that charged him, misses the first guy, but hits the second guy. The 14-year-old boy is the third guy back in line. The, the, the boy is just frozen and does nothing. It just looks. Uh, and this big grizzly bear grabs this guy by his shoulder. And, and the boy said that bear shook him just like a, a cat shakes a mouse. And dropped the guy. The boy thought he was dead. The boy, anyway, no. The bear makes a U-turn and runs back up over the little hill and disappears. So the, the guy was badly hurt. I guess. And uh, so they got him into Fernie here and they all went out the next day, uh, some of the wildlife people, and uh, they tried to figure out what happened. 
Well, when they went on up the slope, they found the carcass of a elk or a, a deer. And the big grizzly bear who charged heard these people coming, they figured. So the bear said, no, no, this is my meat. These guys are not going to get it. So he charged them. And soon as, as soon as the threat was away, the bear, he went galloping back up to guard his, uh, his kill. Uh, the guy who, who, who rolled down the slope, the, the guy first in line, he rolled down to the feet of these grizzly bears. Well, where that, what uh, that was, three younger bears were waiting their turn to get at the kill. Mm. And so they were kind of uh, hanging out in the bushes awaiting their turn to, to try to get some of this kill. And the guy rolled right down into the midst of them. Now, that's only part of the story. This story is, is told, and the uh, television and radio stations across Canada kind of picked it up. Interesting bear story. So uh, in Toronto, I think it was, or Montreal, I'm, I'm not sure which, can't remember, it doesn't matter. Uh, the uh, uh, television people said, we're going to send you three guys out there to Vancouver, and you get that story from BC and interview that guy. This is quite a story. It'll make big news. So they put the three guys in the plane. They fly to Vancouver. The guys get off the plane. They, they meet the, the uh, media people there. And they say, okay, let's, let's go interview this guy. Well, it's going to take a few days. What do you mean a few days? Well, the guy's over in Fernie. Where's Fernie? Well, that's on the other side of the province near the Alberta border. How do we get there? They'll, they said, we, we haven't got time for this. We've got to get this story, but... Uh, we don't know what to do. We but travel by car. There was no air air right. flights in those days. Several days. It'd be a, it'd be a week. Three days travel or in the interview and two or three days back. So they phoned uh, headquarters back in Toronto or Montreal, and the headquarter people said, "Look it. Uh, get on the phone and interview that guy at the hospital, and then one of you take on the role of the guy who was attacked. Take on that uh. guy's role, and get the cameras running." And we'll make the story that way. And that's so, what they did. Hang on, right? And so we're going to continue with yeah. the bear story. Yeah, did just to end up this story. The guy who got mauled, when he told me that story, uh, he got into it a little ways. And when he started to talk about uh, media people from Eastern Canada taking his identity and pretending that they're him and telling the bear story, and he just couldn't tolerate that. He, he just... He just had to swear away. And she was well, so I don't blame him. He was so disgusted. Yeah. That he would call that fake news today. Yeah, yeah. fake <laughs> news. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I, I want to tell you a story about uh, the Kukanusa. Uh, I know a guy from Fernie who uh, drove Caterpillar and Tractor and, and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, he... Uh, it, it, yeah, as you know, when they built the dam, it flooded people out, mm. and there was a lot of oh, hard yeah. feelings uh, by the people, the ranchers, and that still there. people that have never still, gotten over still, it. Yeah. You, you bet. And uh, but but this guy was driving a bulldozer, and he uh, got a job uh, to clear out some of the the, the brush and that along the, the Kootenai River, which is the Lake Kukanusa today. And uh, there was a fence line there, and of course. People, some of the ranchers were quite upset, like you say. And there was a fence line there, and this guy drives his bulldozer up there, and the truck is waiting for him, a half-ton truck, and the guy gets out of it, the rancher. And he says, if you drive that bulldozer across that fence, I'm telling you, I don't care what happens to me, I'll go to jail, but I'm going to kill you. Oh, and he has his rifle. Well... The guy said, this is just a, a job I've got, so he kind of waited, and he phoned or contacted the, his boss, who was a guy from Calgary or Ottawa or Vancouver, I don't know, and the guy came out, there was a stalemate, and uh, the rancher said the same thing to this guy, that guy drives, tears up that barbed wire fence, I'm telling you, he's dead. So, and so the government guy says to the cab driver, I'm the boss here. I'm telling you, here's the order. You want to keep your job? You drive that cat. Keep going. Up that, rip that fence out. Well, 
The guy wasn't sure. So the cab driver says to the government guy, I tell you what, the cat's, the caterpillar's idling, you just push that one lever on the left, and that's the forward lever. You jump up in the cab, and you drive that cat just a few feet across that fence, rip her down, get to the other side, and I'll take over the caterpillar then. In other words, you know, if there's going to be a shooting, that's when it'll be. Uh, but the government guy said, that's enough. He jumped in his car and away he went. Now, eventually the fence was ripped down and the, and the dam was built and so on. But that's one of the, uh, I think, uh, many stories along the Kukunuk side. Oh, yeah. but, but this guy was a tractor driver, and, and he was, and he worked for the city uh, for a while, and he had a front-end loader tractor, and he was on the main street. And they had to do some work on the front of a building or uh, some on the sidewalk, I'm not sure. And he takes his uh, tractor down there, and kaboom, the whole front end of the uh, tractor, the front wheels and, and the bucket and that, drop right down eight, ten feet, right in the middle of the street. Well, they find out later what happened was, he w the tractor was right over one of the numerous tunnels that crisscross the main street of Fernie. Back in the old days, uh, uh, people would gamble. And there were Chinese people left here from building the railway. And they were quite the gamblers. And the upper crust people were, were gamblers. And, uh, and to avoid the law, I mean, what do most people do here? They were miners. They, they know how to tunnel into the ground. So why wouldn't they know how to build, build tunnels from one side of the main street to the other? So they could go through the tunnels unknown to anybody and uh, do their, their boozing and their drinking and, and, and back and forth. And that that was a common certainly, thing. Yes, that certainly is supposed to be true. Yeah. Well, anyway, this guy...